Hello, good afternoon, and congratulations, city. That's wonderful. So I'm Jennifer Chavez Rubio. I'm a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I sit on our global policy and advocacy team. And I'm so pleased to be here today in person. And thank you, Mark, for inviting me to join you and share just a few words about the Gates Foundation's work specific to our economic mobility and opportunity strategy as a lead-in to the amazing panel we'll all hear around strengthening economic mobility. So I have the privilege of leading a portfolio that's focused on private sector engagement around the key issues the Gates Foundation works on, whether it's pandemic preparedness, global health, education, gender equality, or climate, we all recognize that these issues, some of the greatest of our generation, cannot be solved by one funder, one company, one NGO, or one government alone. They do require cross-sector partnerships and innovation, which is, so, uh, which is why I'm so pleased to be a part of this convening today. We are very proud to be partnering with the Chamber Foundation and Mark in particular in the coming year to support diverse small business leaders in key geographies as they strengthen their skills and build their businesses for improved economic growth. I'm really looking forward to getting that work off the ground in the next year. Some of you may be familiar with the Gates Foundation's global work, but I want to share just a bit today about some of our domestic work in economic mobility and opportunity. It's a new strategy that we launched this year and uh, really wanna share just a little bit about it today. So to share just a bit of context for this new strategy, mobility from poverty is decreasing in the US. 90% of children born in 1940 earned more than their parents did. But for children born in the 1980s, that figure has dropped to just 50%. But regardless of education level, most people aspire to live a full life by finding good jobs, working hard, and pursuing opportunities to achieve economic security. Unfortunately, too many people struggle to achieve economic success due to low-wage jobs and bureaucratic processes that make it difficult to access public benefits and tax credits they are eligible to receive. Of those people struggling to achieve economic security, research shows that women and black, Latino, and other persons of color are impacted disproportionately by societal barriers, including sexism and racism in comparison to other groups. The Gates Foundation envisions an economic system that works for everyone and where no one is unfairly left behind. Earlier this year, we expanded our work in economic mobility with a commitment to invest an additional $460 million over the next four years on this issue in the US. And we're particularly focused on helping the 47 million people in the US ages 16 to 64, who face the highest barriers to opportunity and who have the greatest need. Those who make less than $27,180 a year individually or $55,500 for a family of four. So to do this, we're working with local and state governments and with policymakers. We're also working with small and medium-sized businesses we're working in the community and with advocacy organizations, along with other funders and researchers, to help our economic systems perform better to help our focus population achieve long-term economic security. So this work is happening across three priority areas. One of them is about making lives better now by working with organizations on the ground that are addressing the day-to-day -day needs of individuals and families living in poverty, including simplifying the application process for public benefits so people eligible to receive the benefits can access them 
and get other critical services like food, health care, and nutrition. Yes. The next focus area as part of this new strategy is around creating and sharing user-friendly tools and insights with local government, businesses, and other organizations that shape opportunities for our focus population. These tools will help local leaders identify barriers to economic mobility and effective interventions so that millions more people can gain an economic foothold. And then the last area of the new strategy is around bringing together partners across sectors to strengthen the collaboration among those working to increase economic opportunity in their communities. Building partnerships will increase access to funding, enhance understanding of the problems and the solutions, and advance shared goals that build momentum around the work happening in our other priority areas. So with this three-pronged strategy, we really are excited about what we can do into the next four years with this new investment. And this notion of coming together in collaboration is one that I know all of us believe in. So I'm excited to learn from some amazing organizations doing this work. And I'm ready to turn it to our panel who will share lots with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, she mentioned that we're partnering with the Gates Foundation here at the U.S. Chamber Foundation. Um, I wasn't going to make that announcement today, but I'm so glad she did because it's such an exciting program. Uh, it builds off our coalition to back black businesses uh, that we launched a few years ago with American Express. Now we're launching a new program uh, with the Gates Foundation around supporting minority-owned businesses um, and engaging them at the local level with our local chambers. Um, there will be grant opportunities, learn, uh, leadership development opportunities, and real networking opportunities to, to get those minority-owned businesses really plugged into that local business community. Uh, more to come. Um, it's just like fresh off the, fresh off the press. So uh, we're here to talk about economic mobility writ large, and it's such a big issue. Uh, so I want to introduce our panel, and then we're going to dive in. Uh, so we have <clears throat> Balaji Ganapati. He, is the Chief Social Responsibility Officer at Tata Consultancy Services. We have Amy Nakamoto, who's the General Manager of Social Impact at Discovery Education. Both of their companies have been long-term partners of ours, and they truly do amazing work, uh, both here and around the world. So economic mobility, Amy, <laughs> is a broad issue. So we have to start, and let's start with education. Yeah, so, um, so Mark had asked me in, in, in preparing for this, what is the role of education economic mobility? And we only have 38 minutes, so we're not gonna pack all that into today because it's a big topic. Uh, the way that we think about it at Discovery Education, and just a quick, super quick, Discovery Education is a digital first education company. We work with school districts all over this country and then all over the world. So we are reaching about 45 million students globally with digital first approaches to transforming what the classroom looks like. So in terms of economic mobility, we think about our partnership work, which is working with outside companies to infuse in that transformation of teaching and learning. What does the future of work look like? Who is in that future of work? What are those jobs? Who are the people? We know that we have, and it's been said all day today, sort of the, the massive gaps and lack of diversity and lack of representation. That's been there, right? We've, we've had those problems that we've been tackling for, for many years. I think what we're seeing in education is how do we address those things, and now how do we address learning coming out of a pandemic? I think if you've seen any headline over the past two weeks, you've seen the NAEP scores that were released last week, where we're looking at 49 of 50 states sliding backwards in critical things like reading and math. So at Discover Education, we're trying to figure out how do you create awareness for pathways that are addressing workforce development, both at the younger ages, 
How do you connect those pathways to career experiences? That's kind of where we're going next. And then how do you map those experiences to the workforce and the jobs of the future? But now we've got to go also back to how do you supporting teachers at the very young ages and talk about basic math and literacy so that one in, instead of one in four students in eighth grade being ready to prepare themselves for math instruction or computational thinking, as we've done with TCS for years, we need to get those numbers up. So we're looking at economic mobility as the complete K-12 pathway to post-secondary, and it's a huge job. Um, we had launched four years ago. Uh, there were a lot of companies talking about this in individual silos, uh, we decided to step back and say, as an education company, what can we do with a lot of companies together that addresses some of this work? So we launched what's called the STEM Careers Coalition, and some of those great partners are in the room today. DuPont, uh, I think Stanley Black & Decker is here, and Caterpillar, and uh, some, I know I'm missing a bunch of others. Uh, Boeing, our award winner from earlier said, how, what can we do as the collective sort of Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 together to say, this is what the future of work looks like? So I can talk more about that as we go through today, but that was our first step in creating awareness on pathways via education. And another pathway is through technology. And, and biology, uh, TCS has been leading the charge in this and kind of bringing this digital empowers effort uh, to the forefront and engaging people through technology to prepare for the future of work. Can you tell us more about that? Thanks, uh, Mark. It's wonderful to be here among uh, a coalition of the willing, uh, <laughs> energy power to us. Um, I think uh, a couple of things I want to share here. First is from a TCS perspective, we are, a, we are the world's second most valuable information technology company. And what that gives us is the opportunity to understand how to use digital technologies to solve real world problems across different domains, uh, organizations, and country and cultural contexts, right? So more than the power of digital technologies itself, the value of contextual knowledge. So the 2000 organizations that we work with, whether it is companies or countries or communities, uh, that contextual knowledge is at the core of what helps drive innovation and collective knowledge. Now, how do you use that or view that from the perspective of economic mobility? To us, when we think about economic mobility, it is all about democratizing opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not about a goal, but about an outcome, right? And access to opportunity, um, as, uh, as it's been said in research in America and around the world, is your zip code often determines your destiny in life. Yeah. And access to opportunity is often defined by where you are born, where you live, the communities that you live and uh, grew up in, and how do you create pathways so that the vicious circle that you're often born and contained in, um, born into poverty, born into inequality, born into traditional underrepresentation, lack of role models, lack of uh, jobs, lack of entrepreneurial pursuits, um, breaking those barriers is the key to really democratizing opportunity. And technology is at the core of that, right? So we look at it, for example, um, you know, one of the lenses with which we view economic mobility is uh, the, you know, the, the models put forth by Hans Rosling and the Gapminder Institute, for example, which segregates the world into four different income levels, right? Under $2 per day income, which is the ultra poverty of the poor, and then $2 to $8 per day, $8 to $32, and more than $32 per day. And that helps you really identify with the kind of life that you would be living if you were to be in that income level. So then we look at what does progress and mobility mean here, right? And we have to define it in terms of outcomes. And that outcome is societal uplift and generational improvement. Jennifer spoke about you know, the generations before, um, when they are born, are they, are they going to be better off than their parents and the grandparents? So to achieve those outcomes, we have narrowed down on four areas, so four levers to work on. One is literacy, the second is education, the third is employment, and the fourth is entrepreneurship. 
And these are large problem sets to look at. For example, literacy, I don't know how familiar we are with the current statistics, but about 700 million people in the world, give or take, are illiterate. Mm -hmm. So for those people, forget about economic mobility, even access to basic services, um, digital literacy, financial literacy, is the first step they have to take. Yeah. Take uh, the case of education. You have about 800 to 900 million young people who are in K-12 education systems worldwide. And for them, access to skills that are relevant to the 21st century is the key to economic mobility. Take the case of about 500 to 700 million young people who are entering or about to enter the workforce. Um, for them, access to jobs, access to self-employment opportunities is the key to economic mobility. So that's the lens with which we are viewing. And as a large organization that's investing uh, um, our human capital, our intellectual capital, our technology capital, uh, and financial capital to address this, uh, we want to come up with partnered solutions that can address each of these four accelerators or levers. Well, let's, let's stay with technology as a great equalizer, Amy. Yeah. How does Discovery Education offer that? Well, I was actually just going to stay with that word access because I think the key to economic mobility is access. It's access to experiences. It's access to resources. It's access to learning. Uh, and I think the way we think about it as an education company is that's table stakes. You have, if you don't, I, I had this sort of not that original working theory at the beginning of the pandemic that school districts, when they were shut down all over the place, that they needed four things to really just survive. They needed technology. They needed a level of internet connectivity. They needed some level of content and curriculum, and they needed an educator. All four of those things were not stable in any of our communities, right? So there are lots of folks that showed up and helped on the devices and connectivity front. And then school districts were sort of like on their own. So what we try to provide as a company is certainly that access. But we can't do that without partnerships that are bringing and closing that gap between what the real world looks like. I think we made this hypothesis 15 years ago when we stood up our social impact business that if we, if we have the power of technology to infuse the real world, so taking kids on a virtual field trip to you know, the Johnson Space Center with Boeing, then we can unlock anything. So we've been on this kind of 15 year journey of how do you bring in the outside leaders of industry? How do you bring in real world examples of, you know, we took teachers to Auschwitz with the Shoah Foundation. How do you infuse that experience of learning into the classroom? But that's what we have to do. I would say that was what we needed to do 15 years ago via technology. Now we need to actually connect those companies and those partnerships directly in providing access. I almost, I'm going to say this, I don't really know if I should say this, but I almost want to graduate that comment of like, see it to be it. You have to see it to be it. We know that. You have to show students who the leaders are, the diverse faces, the diverse pathways. You have to do that. Like if we're not doing that, then we, like we're, we're really making mistakes. But now we have to move from see it to be it to like, you have to touch and feel it. You have to meet the folks. If, I wanna, if I'm going to meet a software engineer via video, I want to then talk to that person and say, what is the big problem you solved today? What, what does an ideation meeting look like at you know, MasterCard? How are you solving for cybersecurity? Like, those are very cool things for students. So I'd like us to use technology to go from awareness and see it to be it to experiences, first touch career experiences, and then into pathways. So what, what I'm hearing is almost an offer. Yeah. What, <laughs> what are you offering the, the companies in this crowd uh, to do with you? Um, well, there's a lot of things. I think, and Balaji touched on it, I think there is a collective power of working across industry. You know, there is not any one company or industry who can solve any of these problems. Economic mobility and access to education is, is everybody's problem. So I would say the offer I'm making is to get in the room with us and get in the room with each other to kind of pull these things apart, right? Like, let's look at the data, let's look at what's working, let's look at local solutions and global solutions and figure out for communities what's working. So I think get in the room with each other and get in the room with us as an education leader to help figure that out. Thank you. 
So, so Balaji, uh, I'm looking at your lapel pin, right? You've been wearing it for years. And of, of all the CSR professionals I know, when I think of the UN SDGs, I think of you. Um, you're, you travel the world, you see a lot. How is economic mobility working or not working across nations? How are we doing here in the US and what should be done differently? That's, that's a huge question to answer. <laughs> and I think uh, a lot of um, intelligent people are working on those issues. But from my perspective uh, and my experience, I mean, first of all, the pin is there to give perspective, right? That, uh, you, you know, oftentimes we get this inflated view of ourselves and the work that we do. And it's a reminder that, you know, there are larger problems to solve that uh, are not solved yet. And we need, you know, we need to persevere and work in that space. Um, thinking about economic mobility in different parts of the world, I think, um, I mean, I'm going to go out and say this, that um, I don't think the models of economic progress that are there in the world today are uh, set up to democratize opportunity. Uh, if you look at a lot of organizations and businesses and how they create wealth and how wealth is then distributed and who gets to participate in the creation of and distribution of, of, of that wealth, it is not equitable, right? And yet we have within us the capability to make that happen. What possibly is needed is the collective will to make it happen and say that we have to disrupt this uh, approach of uh, money in the hand of a few and then funnel to many through a philanthropic approach. That is welcome and necessary, but you know we crossed 8 billion people in the world this week, right? When we get to 10 billion by 2050, are we going to have more problems in our hand that we need to solve? And that is the worldview that I'm seeing because uh, if you look at the world today and if you look at different parts of the world, um, the common things are that urban economies are doing better than rural economies. Uh, people who are finding the pathway to skills of the 21st century, especially STEM-related skills, are better off in terms of their lifetime and their outcomes um, than others. Um, and that holds most of the places around the world. But if you look at the education systems or the healthcare systems or the um, social safety net systems around the world, they are still um, you know, grappling with the problem of the rural economy and how to cater to people who are not either having access or we don't even know what kind of needs exist. Um, and since uh, Amy has been talking about uh, education, I can tell you, uh, digital, you know, you can bring digital into the solution, but um, take, for example, what happened when we worked with uh, a set of uh, schools in Cape Town in um, South Africa, and another set of schools in the northeast part of India in a small state called Manipur, okay? Real world example. So here we are, well-intentioned, working with the government to identify where the need is and going and working with the school system. You go to the school in South Africa, in Cape Town, and realize that for several hours in a day, there is no electricity. So, I mean, we can be well-intentioned and take all of our digital resources, but they're not going to be able to consume it. So we took lessons from that and thought about how to create unplugged versions of programs so that we are not ignoring those who are in need. And that's where I was talking about the collective will. We have to have the will to go and address where the need is high and the resources are the least, right? The same case with uh, the schools in uh, Manipur. So, we work with the government, we work with uh, the local administration, identified, did the surveys, what is existing and what is not. And they told us that students are familiar to a good extent with English and the national language, Hindi. So we go there and realize, first of all, that um, the 100 teachers who are supposed to be part of those schools, there are only about 70 teachers who are actually there. 
even though 100 are on the roads, and that the students are just not able to understand either Hindi or English. Now, we worked our way around it uh, by uh, investing in local resources and creating um, you know, language-based solutions that cater to their needs. But these are the real-world challenges that you're going to face when, when we are well-intentioned and want to address this issue in different parts of the world. Yeah. And Amy, as we're thinking about different parts of the world, yep. um, discovery education, uh, and I, I didn't know this, and I'm so impressed by it, <laughs> 45 million kids, 4.5 million teachers around the world. Yeah, so I'm going to come back to that, cause yeah. only because I want to yeah. uh, kind of pull a thread a little bit of what Balaji was saying around the, and I'll, I'll come back to that within this answer, around what does that globalization look like and how do you solve for that hyper those hyper-local examples? But then where your question started was, how do you give context to something as big as the SDGs? And how do you get students with the basics that students in schools need to just do learning, table stakes learning, how do you then start to get students to wrap their heads around what is the global responsibility that we all have? And I think there is this amazing thing we have with this generation of students right now who are super hungry and are agents of change themselves. And I do think that collective will, unlocking, like working alongside with young people and working alongside with communities versus kind of a top-down approach, which I think we've seen in philanthropy and we've seen in partnership, is a way to start to bring in lessons of the global challenges. One of the things that we've been wrestling with is, you know, at Discover Education, how do we talk about sustainability in schools? It's not a term that educators are, it's not rolling off their tongue, it's not rolling, that term is not rolling off students' tongue, but climate action is right, like clean water. Those are things that students see, they want to wrestle with, they want to solve for. So we've been kind of at the edges and we're kind of, kind of diving in the deep end in 23 on what does sustainability education look like for middle school students across the globe, not just in this country, but across the globe. And that is where we need the collective will. We need companies who are solving the world's challenges to make it hyper-contextual and hyper-local for young people, which goes to my, which was near where your question was, Education is one of these, it's a global industry that is completely hyper-local. So as an education company who reaches all these places across the globe, it looks different everywhere based on exactly what Balaji was saying, that we have a countrywide partnership with Egypt. They came to us 10 years ago and they said, we need to rewrite our entire science curriculum from what we would call K-12 to here. And it was because they had the highest dropout rate in, that, in sort of that middle, to, middle school to high school so we, for, we did not do any curriculum writing at all. We spent five years with Egyptian educators unsticking their brain of what rote learning looks like. We got them moving, we, had, we introduced project-based learning, we introduced small groups, we introduced technology in sort of bite-sized chunks to rethink what education looks like in the entire country of Egypt. And then we started layering in what does instruction look like, and then we started laying in resources. That's long-term change. So the only other thing I was gonna kind of say with all of this around economic mobility, it's so not a short-term game that everybody here is in this space of impact for a reason, but you can't dive in and out, especially with education. And if, if we're truly gonna take students who are, and, and Jennifer's comments were, kind of staggering, if we're gonna take students from moving from socioeconomic classes, then we've gotta really stick with them throughout that entire space. So we're making progress. We are making progress. <laughs> is a huge job ahead. <laughs> How do we measure it? Whether it's in Egypt or South Africa or India or even here in the US. How, is there a good way to measure it? Uh, I think uh, it's possible to measure. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, usually the measurement tools and the methods that we use is inside out, right? We talk about reach and outcomes and impact from the perspective of what your programs are doing. Uh, but I think um, lately I'm seeing a very positive trend from this, our community of professionals where you're defining success and measurement from the perspective of where the communities are and where they could potentially be, right? So that's really powerful because 
uh, we stop looking at people in communities from a point of deficit mm -hmm. and start looking at them as having agency and having potential. So, for example, I spoke about literacy, right? We have our, our um, literacy as a service program that TCS has used our technology to create. Um, it's a 55-hour program that creates functional literacy among adults. It's um, renowned as one of the best technology-led solutions for literacy in the world. I can say that and feel proud about it. But what does success look like there, right? For somebody who is illiterate, what it means is at the end of that experience, are they able to get access to creating a universal ID? Are they able to create a bank account? Are they able to get access to, um, uh, um, you know, state-provided health care? Uh, do they have life insurance? And to me, you know, that's tangible measure of success. Because when I, uh, 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 one, of the, um, one of the women who was part of the program, talking about last week, one of the stories that I heard, she came back and shared with our prayer rec, who is a trainer of the program, that um, she and her family has been saved from catastrophe. Okay? So we asked what happened, what, what, what went about. And her husband, who was the main breadwinner of the family, who is a farmer, he was suddenly taken ill and um, bedridden and had to be hospitalized. They spent two lakhs, which is um, the equivalent of about um, $2,500 in US terms, but that's their entire life savings. And had she not signed up for the state provided health insurance program, their family would have nothing left. So this is actually resources that are available that they don't have awareness about, that they are entitled to. And now, by gaining access to that, they have at least control of their destiny, right? It is not determined by a calamity or an odd event in life. So that kind of outcome defines success at an individual level. Or take, for example, um, one of the points I wanted to stress on is the role of entrepreneurship in economic mobility, right? We often talk about the urban-rural divide. And I think it is important that we think about it not from the perspective of urbanizing rural economies, but ruralizing rural economies. So how can you help cons non-consumers become consumers and help the community grow on its own? So there, one of our programs is called Bridge IT, where we work with um, rural marginalized youth who are often considered as untouchables from a caste perspective in India, and work with them for a five-year period, okay? Provide them the tools and the resources and the training and the support system, work along with the village to create um, a safe environment where the elders of the village actually propagate for them, build trust, and create a small business where they can serve the local needs of the people in the village. So this is running in about 2,000 villages in India currently. What does success look like? The villagers get access to citizen services. During the pandemic, these entrepreneurs were the only ones who were able to provide financial services to the people in the village. The average income of the entrepreneur is four times the average income of a household in the village. The average entrepreneur is today, who is a woman, marginalized Dalit woman, is today employing at least two to three people on an average. And the amount of cash flow and income flow that happens in the village is adding to the GDP at the village level. So there are social progress outcomes to see and economic progress outcomes to see. So. Um, so that's what I wanted to offer as two examples um, to think about it from a community and people perspective and what could be potential success and how we can contribute to that. Yeah. Uh, we play a part, but so many people in the room here and organizations can play a part in these sort of models. As long as we consider people and communities at the center of this ecosystem, not insert ourselves as the center of that ecosystem. 
Can I jump on that as well and, and talk yeah. about a, a different way? And I, partly when I heard your question, I was like, I want to kind of ask the room, like, how do you guys measuring this? Because I think this is one of the biggest conversations we can have, right? How are we starting to measure, truly measure beyond reach and engagement? Like, what does that change look like? How do how are the community members at Bology talking about how do we know that what we're doing is working? And again, that's a long-term game and it's expensive and all the things that we need to invest in. But I also want to start to think about what are the, for lack of sounding super nerdy, like what are the KPIs that uh, look at how we start to get there? So if we're talking about workforce development, one of the things that I'm going to call kind of drum beats is, is something we've been paying attention to at Discover Education. So we made a promise to our STEM Careers Coalition partners four years ago that we would connect companies with school leaders and school districts differently than we've been able to do in the past. That not only is it thought leadership, but we really want companies to hear directly from educators, what, does, what do I need to do as a teacher to prepare my young people to be in your jobs in that industry? And then we similarly wanted companies to hear from educators you know, like, these are the challenges that I have from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and beyond. And when you invest in us as, as a community, here's what's helpful and here's what's not. We didn't want to be in the way of that. So, so one such drumbeat this past, I want to say, two months ago, and we'll call him out, but Pat McCrumman had, DuPont had the state leaders in the state of Delaware to the DuPont headquarters. And it was this really momentous moment where industry was talking with educators and it was an equal playing field. Just saying like, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing, here's what's working, here's what's not working, here's what's next. Two months later, we repeated that. We had the um, government affairs team from Boeing talking with the state leaders at Oklahoma. Just Monday, we had in Elko, Nevada, a very rural county, in the northeastern corner of Nevada, we had Nevada gold mines with the state superintendent talking, just again, talking with each other about how do we look at the numbers of graduation rates? How do we look at preparedness? So those are three drum beats. Yeah. If we can measure drum beats of all the ways that we're connecting companies directly with the people who are talking with and working with teachers every day, then let's say this time in 2023, we have 24 drum beats. We've got, and then we're starting to build this place where we're breaking down those barriers of like, here's what one industry needs, here's what educators need, and here's what students and communities need. Yeah, and uh, coincidentally, we heard that when Anita was up here with KPMG mm -hmm. from her high school teacher that she brought with her, right? Remember? And he, he said that. I mean, the teachers are saying this. You know, let us come to your company, not just the students, but the teachers and the yep. administrators as well so we can learn and see what it's like for you every day and what you need, and vice versa. Let's invite you into our schools so you can learn and see what we need uh, and make that partnership. And the Chamber Foundation's Center for Education and Workforce has been at that for a while too. And mm -hmm. you've got great companies like Discovery Education who are you know, putting the pieces together. And I think that's where we're gonna go next is around partnerships, right? We cannot do this alone. Uh, it has got to be the private sector, the public sector, nonprofits, all in. Balaji, what are some of the best partnerships that you've seen to help advance economic mobility? And that's, that's an opportune question, especially in a forum like this. Um, I think uh, the best partnerships are ones where people share your common sense of uh, purpose in terms of what the intended outcomes are and then are able to really rally around their respective roles, right? This is easier said than done. I mean, we've, we've had our dance over the years and it took time for even an established organization like uh, Chamber and for TCS to come together around common goals, right? So the intentions are always good and you want to have certain outcomes, but I think uh, it requires patience and perseverance and openness to understand that there could be unconventional partnerships that can be formed. Take, for example, our student-facing program, GoIT, which is today in 43 countries around the world, uh, delivered in about 13 different languages, aimed at girls and underrepresented minorities. Um, each of them are shifting from being consumers of technology to creators and innovators. They are identifying local problems and they are able to uh, come up with solutions and use technology to solve those problems. 
Now, here, the fundamental construct is content, context, and connection. These three are the elements of the success of a part partnership or a model like this, right? So who can bring in content? TCS can bring in some of the industry content, but who is going to help with pedagogical input so that it is aligned to curriculum, aligned to the learning needs of people, right? Context, how do you apply that in the real world? We work with about 160 of our clients on this effort. So um, they help contextualize it from the perspective of a financial services or an automotive or a telecom a business or a, a healthcare business. They bring that context. And finally, the connection, right? Connection in terms of access to whom is in need. Their nonprofit organizations, school systems can play a big role but also connection to real world experiences where employees from your organization uh, can really be that if you can be it, mm -hmm. if you can see it, you can be it mm -hmm. uh, models, right? Yeah. So partnerships in that sense with uh, organizations, but also internal organization. I think uh, many people today spoke about um, using or drawing upon the power of networks within the company itself. Right? We have 600,000 people working for TCS around the world. And that's our best capacity to use in terms of solving the connection problem. Right? So uh, in that example, con con content, context, and connection, these are the kind of partners that bring it to life. And it could be added on top of that, you could have thought leadership forum partners like yours, mm -hmm. uh, policy organizations, so that it's not just one and done. But school systems are then able to advocate and say that, hey, what worked for me here in uh, rural Arkansas can be adopted uh, statewide, which is what we are doing with uh, uh, Garner Hutchinson in uh, Arkansas and the computer science um, uh, education department there, right? And many places around the country. So policymakers, you add all of these layers on top and it becomes a very rich experience in terms of partnerships and outcomes. So, but always you know, revolving around what is the intended outcome and how can we support that. Yeah. So I will try not to repeat all the great things that Balaji just said. I will say what we've learned in partnerships and, and my advice, I guess, would be figure out what your non-negotiables are, whether that's your corporate mission or you know, the expectations internally or your alignment to your ESGs. But then also have a really hard conversation about what's flexible, meaning if you're going to partner with community organizations or you know, some of the partnerships we've had, our best partnerships are sort of like, we trust you because you are the education expert. You know teachers, you know curriculum, you know marketing to teachers, you know, you know all those things. And you know, we know, let's say, you know, health equity. We know that space. So like, how do we bring what the partners bring to the table, what we all bring to the table, and let the, the experts do what the experts do really well with the central sort of mission and trust of the outcomes for young people. Um, the other thing in partnership I would say is that there is urgency now, and I'll just speak on behalf of education, that we haven't seen before. So, you know, again, 15 years ago when Discovery Education launched the social impact side of the business, it was this kind of green field, like, what can we do? Like, this is amazing. We now have the opportunity to bring companies into the classroom that authentically and genuinely is connecting with young people. Like, what can we do? It was ideating, it was creative. But now we're sort of like, what can we do? Like, what do we need to do next? Because there's more urgency. So I think the critical thing in partnerships is to not get in our own way, because when we're talking about economic mobility, there are students and communities that do not have, do not experience, don't have access, and they don't really have time for us to spend nine months kind of working through our own stuff to get yeah. to the partnership. I think we need to figure out how do we get to, the, get to the what faster. Yeah, and I think that's one of the points that you cannot forget. It's know what you're good at and know what you're not. Mm -hmm. you know, what is the superpower and where do you need help? Um, earlier in the, in the panel, I talked about the coalition to back black businesses that we started with American Express. And uh, Richard Brown, who was at American Express when we started, he's here. Um, and he had the foresight to challenge us as the U.S. Chamber, like, you know, the largest business federation in the world, to say, you need help to do this program. 
And that challenge led us to partner with the four national black business organizations across the United States, the U.S. Black Chamber, the National Black Chamber, Walker's Legacy, and the National Business League, to tell us what we didn't know. Like, how can we help these black entrepreneurs? And the program has grown, not just in terms of the amount of grants that we've given out, but the amount of applications that we're getting. In this, this cycle for this year, we got almost 40,000 applications for this program. Wow. Now, we, we only have a fraction of, of funds to, to help them. So then we thought to ourselves, what else aren't we good at? And that is <laughs> how to help the other you know, 35,000 of them. Um, and we just partnered with Ernst & Young, EY, because they have all these services uh, that they'll offer for free. So now all of a sudden, there are, you know, these black entrepreneurs all across the United States have access to these EY services to help them grow their business. And that's economic mobility, mm -hmm. right? So we're almost out of time. Um, last thoughts, someone said to me, make sure your panelists always leave the one thing that the audience has to remember <laughs> about what you said. So Balaji, we'll start with you. What's the one thing this audience has to remember? I think stay true to your purpose of uh, democratizing opportunity and understand from your perspective what that means for whom you're trying to serve. And I think the rest will, uh, you know, you can figure the rest of it out. But if you're very clear that democratizing opportunity is the path to economic mobility, and what is your role to play in that, you will definitely uh, have success uh, for whom you're trying to serve. Um, so last week I was at an event with, um, I was sitting next to the Utah Teacher of the Year. He was a sixth grade teacher at a Title I elementary school in Utah. And I said, I am going next week to talk about economic mobility and education. And I said, what should I say to this group of business leaders? And he said, kids know that there's a wealth of people out there that care about them, and that are working hard for them, but they can't see them. Like, and, and he works really hard to bring these creative like, lawyers in the classroom to help them do public speaking and all these fun things. And he said, like, let this group know that kids know they're out there, but they want to see them. And so that's what I would say, sort of dive in. We've been talking about that. I think making sure that kids can see economic mobility by seeing all of your companies is probably the best thing we can do. Yeah. And with that, Amy, apology, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you.